Plant. Welcome back, Movement Specialist, to another special edition of Triplane Function. In the first video, we talked about really how this humerus bone interfaces with the scapula here to cause shoulder impingement. And that's only half the story, whenever the shoulder, your humerus, moves on this. In Triplane Function, we do talk about how top-down motion occurs, but so does bottom-up motion. In this case, the humerus is the top-down part, and the scapula here is going to be the bottom-up. So talking about shoulder impingement as, as it relates to scapula dyskinesis or scapular dysfunction, we realize that if the scapula, just like with Earl here, that's pinned here, is going to be a recipe for a lot of shoulder impingement. Because usually whenever the humerus elevates, when the humerus moves up in flexion or abduction, the scapula also moves. A lot of people term that just upward rotation. But there's really three planes of motion that the scapula needs to go into to really reduce the risk of impingement. As the scapula, so let's go ahead and come, come up pretty close here, Steve. As we abduct, because this greater tubercle is gonna be hitting into the sacromion, the scapula also tends to upwardly rotate. Now, like I said, Earl, I can't move his scapula very well. It's pinned down. That's not how it is normally, naturally. But you can see as this arm moves up, how his scapula can move up as well to reduce the risk of impingement from that greater tubercle. That's only that one plane, one plane of motion in that frontal plane, this upward rotation. In the front and the sagittal plane, what also has to happen is something that I feel is under addressed, that people don't see readily in their mind's eye, nor do they treat it. The scapula needs a fair amount of posterior tilt, that the scapula needs to not tilt forward as it, what happens with people with rounded shoulders, slump posture, pretty bad. In fact, this scapula needs to tilt backwards. And you'll realize that if I take Earl, have him tilt his scapula backwards, that actually flattens out the sacromion. If he's forward, that actually dries it down. I've used the analogy that Steve really likes, that as the, as the acromion goes down, it's like a dagger that is going to be jamming into the um, lesser tubercle as well as the greater tubercle with motion. And once you add that posterior tilt, it frees up quite a bit of space. An inch, I mean, a, a probably millimeter of motion through the scapula and the posterior tilt will probably give you one or two inches of hand elevation as that hand is moving upwards. So that's the sagittal plane. If someone is just tilted and protracted, are you really thinking in the sagittal plane that we need to drive their inferior angle down as well as pull this superior angle backwards to get this effective posterior tilt. And finally, in the transverse plane, something that, again, when people with rounded shoulders, they're in this protracted position or scapular internally rotated position to where this, this dagger is now pointing down and in, but what happens if we move the dagger away? Again, that frees up a little bit of motion that as your shoulder blades can pinch backwards, go through a retraction, or go through external rotation, the more apt that this humerus is going to also be able to follow and go into the external rotation component we talked about that was so important to the, gleno uh, the, the glenoid, the, I mean, so the humeral component of that external rotation as the hand elevates. So with that, we established that the scapula itself needs to go through three planes of motion as the hand lifts up. That's going to be a posterior tilt in the sagittal plane an upward rotation in the frontal plane, and then a retraction or external rotation of the scapula in the transverse plane. Is that the whole entire story? Absolutely not. Because we have something that Earl actually demonstrates quite well. The scapula is fixed on top of this rib cage. It's not really fixed as a normal joint is. For a lot of people, this is called a pseudo joint, just because it doesn't have any direct articulations, much like the ball and socket. These ribs play a huge play into where the scapula goes. If someone is limiting, is limited in that posterior tilt, as I drive this scapula backwards, you can even see, I don't know if you can see that in the video right here, you can see this rib, which looks like to be his eighth rib here. As I pull back, you can see that rib is going forward. What motion is that of the rib cage when you take it globally? As this rib moves forward, you're getting a net rotation of the ribs to the left. So if someone is limited in their posterior tilt, you might think of a soft tissue issue, much like what we talked about with a pec minor video. But could it be also a bony issue to where this rib, and 
more often than not, it's not just this rib. You need all the ribs to left rotate as this scapula posteriorly tilts. We're kind of combining planes. It can get confusing. Sagittal plane motion of the scapula yields transverse plane motion in the ribs. Or maybe better yet said, you need transverse plane motion of these ribs, which attach to this thoracic spine, into left rotation to get this right scapula effectively posteriorly tilted. Do you ever treat someone like that? When someone's limited in posterior tilt, do you think that, hey, I'm going to get some rotation of these ribs? Okay, I'm going to get some rotation of this thoracic spine. Are you just trying to continue to mobilize them just by cranking on their spine doing posterior to anterior mobilizations or doing unilateral rib mobilizations? Is there a more effective way that you can get this to happen? And so this is where a lot of, um, one of my mentors would call this a torque converter. Sagittal plane motion in one joint causes another plane of motion in the nearby joint. In this case, it's going to be transverse plane motion of the ribs. Same thing happens with an upward rotation. When the scapula upwardly rotates, and I hope you can see this, that you need to have those ribs come with you. They need to flare up, much like they flare up when you inspire and expire. Expire will deflate, pull them down. When you inspire, it will pull it up. Are you thinking about that frontal plane motion of the ribs, where your ribs, to get effective upward rotation of the scapula, your ribs also need to have this side bending component. This one would be an example of not having a torque converter, that frontal plane motion in one will lead to frontal plane motion in the other. Regardless, if someone's having this gunky scapula that's not moving and it's causing shoulder impingement right here at the glenoid, are you just focusing on that anterior shoulder pain right where they're experiencing the issues? Or are you focusing on how this scapula moves in relationship to the ribs and the thoracic spine? Noticing that it needs to be, for this right scapula, you need to get some relative rotation to the left from the ribs as well as the thoracic spine, as well as left side bending motion or opening up motion of the ribs as this upwardly rotates. So hopefully through this, you movement specialists can understand a little bit more about the bony biomechanics of how a shoulder moves. Having the shoulder move and have the scapula move, the next joint up is not going to just be your cervical spine. You need to think about how this scapula interfaces with these ribs and also how these ribs are interfaced with the whole entire thoracic spine. You need a lot of mobility in the T-spine as well as the ribs to get effective fluid motion of that scapula. And if an effective fluid motion of the scapula, more often than not, yields a more effective uh, motion in that glenohumeral joint or that shoulder joint. Thank you again for joining us in Triplane Function. We'll see you next time.